Uh, he's a senior application scientist at Wasatch Photonics. And if you're asking why is he doing today's talk here in this uh, NDT for Industry session, it's because first of all, we are uh, happy users and then certified users of Wasatch Photonics instruments. That's first of all. And uh, during the last years, we have joined forces on several projects, especially in its application for inline PET, for process and vertical technology, but also to explore the limits and possibilities uh, given by the Rama technology. And uh, here I'm happy to say that, especially in recent years, uh, there's uh, quite some progress that we witness, first of all, in terms of sensitivity, but also in terms of miniaturization. So this makes it even more attractive for process and vertical applications. Uh, as said, uh, we have applied it for several uh, process analytic uh, challenges already. Unfortunately, we cannot talk of, about all the installations because the customers sometimes don't want that to be uh, spread out into the world. But uh, Mr. Bingman uh, will have some examples he can talk about. And one of them uh, we did together is the corrosion uh, analysis. But also we did some work, which is probably not focus of today, but in uh, development of service and enhanced Raman spectroscopy substrates. So quite a diverse uh, kind of cooperation and different topics that we look at. But well, I do not want to steal too much time of uh, Dieter Bingemann's time and uh, hand over the word to him and looking forward to a very interesting overview presentation on the possibilities with Raman spectroscopy for process analytics. Um, thank you. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction and uh, the invitation to give a presentation here today um, about Roman spectroscopy. Uh, if, you, if you admit it, somewhere in the back of your kitchen cabinet, you all have this mystery jar with compound that you have no, it's unlabeled, you have no idea what's in it. And uh, it, in the kitchen, it's pretty easy. You can just like open it up and try it and you figure out this one is actually sugar. But if you have, if you find like a little plastic baggie with a white powder in it uh, on the suspect on the street, you might not want to stick your finger in it. And if there's like a, a lab type sample with the white powder in it, you often have no idea what's in it. So here comes, here comes Raman spectroscopy for the rescue. All you need to do is point the laser at your sample and the light, I'm not sure if you can see this, but the light that scatters it's right here, the light that scatters back at you from that sample, the green light in this case, that contains all the information you need to figure out what's in that container without ever opening that container. All you need to do is send this light to a spectrometer and let it let the spectrometer decode the information. Well, there's a few additional steps and I'll talk about those, but that's why I'm a big fan of Raman spectroscopy. That scattered light contains so much detailed information and that, that will be one of the, the, the topics to focus of today. So, what is what is Raman spectroscopy? If you hold on, if you want to switch forward. It's always the problem when you are with the laser pointer, then you need okay. the arrow keys to or just skip skip there, slides well, with the arrow keys. keys. Um, what is Raman spectroscopy? So in in a nutshell, you basically hit your sample with a laser. The, uh, the light that scatters back at you is most of the time just the regular laser light, unaltered, unchanged. But sometimes, one in a million times, some of the some of the photons lose some energy and scatter back at you with a different wavelengths. And that's that's Raman spectroscopy. Um, it's it's so it's really easy to use. You have no sample preparation to do. You can actually go through a container because the laser can come in and the light can come out through the container. It won't destroy the sample. And as an extra benefit, because it's a vibrational spectroscopy, uh, it, because that, that laser, the, the, the wavelength shift that you see is coupled to the molecule, to the vibrations of the molecule, it's a vibrational spectroscopy, and therefore it's highly specific. And unlike the other vibrational spectroscopies that you might be familiar with, near infrared spectroscopy or FDIR, infrared spectroscopy, water absorption is actually not a problem for the laser. Yeah, so you can you can actually observe samples in, a, in an aqueous solution in water really easily. It, the water doesn't matter at all for Raman spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy also has a downside. It's a very weak process. Um, and so it's sensitive to other interferences. One of the biggest ones can be fluorescence. Um, <clears throat> 
Raman spectroscopy has the image of being like really hard, bulky, expensive, big setups. You need big lasers, powerful lasers, nitrogen cooling. It takes a long time. The measurements can take an hour and so on. That's the image we have in the back of our head, back from the 80s. Things have changed radically. Raman spectroscopy now is actually really easy. What you see on the bottom right is a really compact instrument that has everything included that you need. There's the laser in the front left. There's uh, the electronics in the back. This, the bench is sort of hidden under the electronics. Everything is in one compact unit that's that's maybe maybe slightly bigger than the, than your hand. And there's there's so much development, recent developments that this will actually change even more in the future. So just to give you a scale bar. Uh, this is this is me with two setups, right? So it's not like a big laser table. You said two complete setups at, at, a, at a trade show, but you see how small things got and how easy it got. You just connect your your box, your spectrometer, uh, and uh, to a computer, and there goes your there you see your Raman spectrum in the background. Um, what is what's actually inside one of those spectrometers? I'll show you, I'm showing here. Again, you see in the front left. Uh, you have a little scale bar, like a pen on the side. On the front left, it's the it's the laser. It's already included. The the, the L shaped thingy that's the bench, the optical bench that does the magic of the, of analyzing the light that scatters back at you. And the back right is the electronics you need to read the detector, communicate with the with the computer. And that big nitrogen cooling tank you saw on the earlier on the earlier picture, that's now the little uh, heat sink, the little blue heat sink you see in the back. With a little fan. That's all that's needed these days with tech cooling because the measurements get cut so fast, you can actually record a Raman spectrum these days in a second or less. So you don't need this uh, this ex extensive cooling that you used to need. You know? um, today, I want to, the Raman spectroscopy actually applies to many different application areas. Uh, some of the strength of Raman spectroscopy are because it's a vibration of spectroscopy, that it's very, very specific. No two molecules have the same spectrum. You can tell any molecule apart from any other molecule in the world. So it's really used for identification. And some of the examples that come to mind are incoming quality control, safety applications, security, think about the police force. You know. And what's what's coming in the, uh, what's up and coming is actually medical diagnostics, because this specificity can actually distinguish uh, a sick type tissue or a or plot serum from a healthy type tissue. That, that is, that's, the, that's an application that's still coming, but it builds on the same high specificity that we see in Raman spectroscopy. The focus of today is slightly different. I want to talk about monitoring, observing a process like a longer complex process in different types of environments that the media and here they use a different app, uh, different strength of Raman spectroscopy. Think of Raman spectroscopy here as an instantaneous, non-destructive, non-contact chemical analysis, basically in a second inside a container. Yeah, that's that's sort of the picture I want you to keep in mind. Um, and with that, with that, I want to just introduce the three examples that that I will talk about just very briefly. My goal is not to go into detail on these examples. If you have specific questions, we have, I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A session. I just want to give you like a glance, like a, just scratch the surface, give you just an idea of what might be possible. So the first project is the steel corrosion that uh, like already talked about. Uh, it's, it's a joint, it's, it was a wonderful collaboration with a number of Austrian uh, groups. And one of them is, is recent. And I was I was really happy with with the results what we find, and it's it's a process really slow process, but Raman spectroscopy was able to give us enormous detailed insights uh, into this process. The second application is is the fermentation. I'm showing here like a Google picture of a professional setup. What you see later is the poor man's version of uh, what what I was able to do without the setup, but it's it still shows the principle that you can observe this process despite all the complications of uh, the, the, the cells, the biotechnology cells being in there in that process. And the third one is the crystallization uh, process. 
it's much quicker. It, it, it happens in a few minutes, but it is really, really important. And the demo, ex the demonstration example happened in a few minutes. In industry, it actually often takes a lot longer, but it's really important to be able to observe and possibly control this process, and especially in the pharmaceutical industry. So let's just jump into the first example, the steel corrosion. Like I said, it's a collaboration, a wonderful collaboration. Uh, and uh, it's actually been published in Spectroscopy magazine. Uh, you see the link on the bottom. I, I assume you can, you'll be able to share the slides later. Otherwise, Resend or Wasatch will be happy to uh, send you the link. Um, I just want to give you an, a, a glimpse of what, what happened, what we did. Uh, the idea was, uh, to keep a steel sample in an environmental chamber that is uh, facilitating a really fast corrosion process. And fast here means a few days. It won't take a year for the steel sample to corrode. It takes a few days. That's, in my mind, a slow process, but it's still fast for corrosion. The way this is done is a typical, it's a salt fog, a warm salt fog environment. So it's a very, very harsh environment. And uh, we were able to introduce a Raman probe pointing right at the steel sample that you see as this little brown rusty slide here, but inside this chamber in a really harsh environment, the Raman probe was completely encapsulated to protect it from the environment. But what we see here is that we were able to observe the steel sample through this protection for the Raman probe. The spectrometer was not free floating like shown in this picture here, it was off to the side, but it's fiber coupled. So it could be outside of this, uh, this corrosive environment. Um, <clears throat> we actually, the, the steel sample was then held a day or two in wet salt fog, warm salt fog conditions, a day or two in dry conditions, and back and forth. So this sort of simulated typical atmospheric corrosion conditions. It rains, the sun is back, it rains, and so on. So it's uh, that's that's a simulation that uh, was uh, repeated in this experiment. Um, <clears throat> to show you what the Raman spectroscopy can do for you, here is a few example spectra from different phases of this project. Again, the bluish lines indicate the wet phases, the orangey type lines, they indicate the dry phases. And what you see, I don't want you to go into exact details, but you see that all these spectra, these wiggly lines, plotted here as Raman intensity as a function of the Raman shift, which encodes what frequency is responsible for its peak. And these, these spectra are all slightly different. Some peaks repeat and some peaks are only visible in some of those phases. So already at this point, we can, we can identify individual species that are listed here as like oxyhydroxides, even a carbonate was part of it, a magnetite that's Fe3 or, uh, Fe3 or 4, or a typical iron oxide, Fe2 or 3. All these different species could be identified in this qualitative pictures with at these different phases of the experiment without ever taking the sample out, without ever destroying the sample, and on, on the fly in situ in this in the chamber, these could be identified. So really detailed qualitative insight into the species that are present. But we didn't just take four spectra. We actually took a whole lot of them. We took a spectra every five minutes because we didn't destroy the sample. I actually don't expect you to be able to distinguish these different lines. This is just a subset of the thousands of spectra that were analyzed in this, in this process or for this process in this experiment. But you see that in these different phases, there's clearly very different looks, uh, also as a function of time. And we can now go through a data analysis step and turn these spectra into information about species. Which species come and go at what point, what time, how fast in that process. So we could actually um, um, extract a detailed time evolution four very different species in this corrosion process without ever taking the sample out in situ, right? A very detailed insight that in, to, my, to my knowledge was actually not known before this experiment. Yeah, this shows how Raman spectroscopy can provide very detailed information about processes, time evolution, species presence, uh, 
in in a process uh, in a sample just to give you an idea i don't want didn't want to go into more details how the analysis done but just to give you an idea of how much detail is is available with raman spectra i want to just move on to the second uh, example so here's the poor man's version of a biotechnology experiment right aaron my flask with glucose and yeast mixed and as you know glucose and yeast uh, produce ethanol and carbon carbonic acid and carbonic acid or co2 carbon oxide <clears throat> this is just it's just a simple lab experiment that ran overnight um and but it's it's a sample that was steered uh there's there's a probe that sticks right into that uh in, into that cloudy the cloudy solution the cloudiness is the yeast um and i observed it overnight so i took the spectrum i think every two seconds um or <clears throat> it, I, I took large number of spectra because it's really easy. Yeah, so the setup is shown here also like the probe sticking into the sample and the spectrometer, spectrometer and here it's a separate laser in the background. Um, I want you to uh, look at those two spectra that are important species in this process. The top one is the glucose spectrum uh, and you see a lot of peaks and the most significant one of those is the one around 1100 the sort of the one under the S, the one the, like the, the bigger mountain with this one peak. Um, the bottom spectrum is the ethanol spectrum, and it has this Batman feature at around, around 1100. That's sort of how it's easily recognizable. But what we see later is this bigger peak at 890 wave numbers. So those two things, just keep that in mind. This sort of rugged mountain at 1100 is glucose. The 890 peak is ethanol. Yeah. So. Moving on, this is this is the spectra of these are the spectra of um, this twelve-hour process, this overnight fermentation of my glucose yeast mixture as a function of time. We start on the bottom in a darker color, we end up on the top in a lighter color, and you see it's like fifty thousand seconds, so it's about twelve hours. Um, the glucose peak you can identify as smart, like this little rugged mountain at eleven hundred. The ethanol peak you can see on the top at this single peak at around 890. And you can already see that the glucose is disappearing and the ethanol is appearing. So again, we get detailed insight into the process in this biotechnology demonstration. It's really just a toy experiment. Um, <clears throat> what you also see is this background increasing. That is the yeast uh, uh, flourishing, growing, and uh, increasing basically cell density increases. So we can also get information about the yeast in this, um, in this experiment. <clears throat> what you see here is one strength of Raman spectroscopy that you can actually observe many things at once in the same process. You don't have to take samples out, you can just stick the probe in the sample. And for biotechnology, this is really important because these the solutions have to be kept sterile. Now, I didn't work sterile in my experiment. It was like yeast and glucose. You don't need to be sterile. But for biotechnology and pharma applications, this, this is paramount, being sterile. You cannot open the container. And these processes don't just go overnight. They sometimes take 14 days. So you still want to get, gain information, but you cannot take a sample out. So sticking a probe in is often the only option. Uh, we could now actually go a step further, rather than just doing this qualitative uh, consideration that I just offered, group was going away, ethanol coming in, and the yeast flourishing, we can actually do calibration measurements up front. Yeah, I did based, I did different glucose concentrations, well-known glucose concentrations, recorded Raman spectrum, with different amounts of yeast as interference, <clears throat> and use these spectra to determine a calibration, a model for an analysis then I can feed a spectrum going in and I get the number out, out of this analysis, which tells me what's the glucose concentration. So I can now send this entire slew of spectra into my, my analysis, my model, and it tells me what is the glucose concentration at what point in my, in my process. So over this entire 50,000 seconds, I see how the glucose concentration decrease, how much sugar the yeast was eating away and so on i could have done the same for ethanol and uh, at the same time recorded how the ethanol comes in yeah so again raman spectroscopy highly specific this was possible despite the inf interference by yeast 
Um, and <clears throat> it allows me to even do quantitative predictions uh, for these concentrations. Yeah, so it's going a step further. As a third example, the last example, uh, this is this is the crystallization process. The experiment being done here is to dissolve paracetamol or acetaminophen in different on different continents. It's called differently. Tylenol is a trade name in the US. It's it's a common drug um, for for headache and as a painkiller uh, and uh, to to lower fever. Uh, and it dissolves in hot methanol, but it doesn't dissolve in cold methanol. So a high concentration of paracetamol was dissolved in hot methanol and the methanol was just allowed to cool. Really simple experiment. Again, it's just a demonstration about the capability. The Raman spectra were again recorded as a function of time while the methanol cooled. Uh, and suddenly you saw the crystallization. It was it became cloudy. And, uh, and we looked at the Raman spectra afterwards. So in the middle shown is the full set of spectra. And at the first glance, you would think that, well, they all pretty much look the same. What's what's happening here? What's the difference? But there are actually differences. If you zoom in and the pixelated view shows you how it's zoomed in, how much it's zoomed in, you see that going from black, that's early, to light color, which is late, some of the peaks get smaller, some of them get maybe a little wider, a little narrower, but this peak all the way on the right sort of completely changed. And you might think, well, these are just such minor differences here in the spectra. Is this really significant? Is this really, because I don't see any radical changes here, no big peaks coming or something. But keep in mind, we're looking at the same molecule, acetaminophen or paracetamol, first in solution in methanol, and then as a solid in crystal, as a, in crystalline form. So it's the same chemical. You don't expect the spectrum to change dramatically. But what we see is that the environment of this single molecule, if it's dissolved in methanol, or if it's sort of stacked with other molecules of paracetamol, makes a significant difference in the spectrum. And these differences we can see. Yeah? Raman spectroscopy can also not just tell molecules apart, it can, it can tell the environment apart for the same molecule. Yeah, it can tell the difference between the dissolved and the solid form of paracetamol. It can even go one step further. But the Raman spectroscopy is the only technique that I know of that is in, in a process can tell you which crystal form actually just formed, which crystal structure just formed. And for pharmaceutical industry, that's the difference between FDA approved uh, active ingredient and just a ton of garbage. If they don't have FDA approval for that wrong crystal structure, it's it's complete, it's worthless for pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, so it's Raman spectroscopy again, highly specific, can tell minor differences that are not available with other techniques. Yeah, so three simple examples: uh, steel corrosion, uh, biotechnology, and this this crystallization process here, all showing how in in process you can gain very detailed information of different kinds. Yeah. So with that, I'm, I want to summarize what, what, we just, what I've just tried to introduce to you. What uh, I, I didn't want to go into the details of the analysis, any of that. I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what is possible. But I hope what you get away from this, what you take away from this is that Raman spectroscopy is unsurpassed in its specificity. There's no other technique spectroscopic technique that can reach this level of specificity of uh, detailed information. At the same time, it's super easy to use. Again, you just hit the sample with your laser and the light that comes back tells you all you need to know. Yeah, it's non-contact, non non-destructive and such. It's it's perfect match for monitoring application. In all these cases that I showed you, there is some data analysis that's needed. That's, that's actually common for all spectroscopic techniques. Yeah, you have to turn this wiggly line, the way I like to call it, into actual actionable information. That is, that is important. So you need to take the spectrum, run it through some analysis. We call this often like a model. You run it through a model, and you get your answer. This model needs to be developed, and it needs to be maintained. Now, that's, like I said, that's actually typical for spectroscopic techniques. You can't just hook up a spectrometer. It tells you immediately what the answer is unless you have this 
at this model. Yeah. Raman spectroscopy is uh, is up and coming. It's the cool kid in town, right? It is really it's the future for Raman. I in my mind is so bright. You got to wear sheets, and it's not just laser goggles, right? It's the the technological advances that we've seen, and especially in the past ten years, have have brought Raman spectroscopy forward so dramatically. What what we now have in terms of miniaturization, simplification of the of the application. And the cost reduction in the end for the user is dramatic. Uh, I actually it, it can show you what the prototypes these days, they, they shrink down to the size of the computer mouse. Yeah, yeah, so it's what the the future is is really bright. Um, thanks to the detailed insights that Raman spectroscopy writes, I'm sure there's also more and more, it will find more and more applications and some of which will be in process monitoring. Yeah, so I think Raman could actually also provide detailed insights, maybe also in your next project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bingemann, for this really interesting and on-point talk. Um, I think more fans of Raman are now in the world. <laughs> You're a big fan already, you said that. I'm a big fan in the meantime as well. And I have to say some years ago, I was not uh, aware of all the possibilities and uh, we are more and more applying Raman. So I completely agree with you that uh, what is going on at the moment, also from a techno technological point of view, is really, is really interesting.